Good evening and welcome. My name is Frank Hitton. I'm the CEO of Reconciliation Victoria. I'd like to start by just acknowledging that we are on Aboriginal land, the land of the uh, Kulin Nations peoples, uh, the Wurundjeri and the Bunurong specifically around this area. Also welcome to the City of Melbourne's Talk Black Annual Reconciliation Week uh, discussion. And tonight's topic is familiar to most people, if you over about 20, I suppose, and watched any television at all. And it's about land rights. When do we want it? What's the answer? <laughs> we need a bigger now than that. Uh, land rights, when do we want them? Yeah. Right, we're getting off to a good start. Thank you. Um, I'll just start very quickly by introducing Anita Briggs, who will do a welcome to country. Anita? Mm. And that's Aretha, as in Aretha Franklin. I'd like to uh, start today by introducing myself. My name's Aretha Mukarich Briggs. I'm the granddaughter of Geraldine and Selwyn Bora Briggs. Uh, I'm a descendant of the Woiwurrung clan, Wurundjeri Baluk being my family clan. Uh, my descendancy comes down through my great-grandmother, who is Mariah, who is the sister to Simon Wonga. So I stand here very privileged and honoured to speak on behalf of my ancestors. I'm about to speak in the Woiwurrung language, which I am in the midst of reviving. My introduction will go like this. Nē, nogalik panjol māmen ba liwiko. Mani wanarita ngokalich briggs, mangi pebejenik, nogalangintana wirigirio. Kanbunwan, yinga gabarang, no kologandana, naren nakaranganga. Ba yiling bo mane, mange, monye, kurubil, kolen, ba man men gereptan. I welcome you all here today on behalf of my ancestors, as a messenger of my ancestors. And I'd like to say I'm happy to welcome you to this country of the Woiwurrung on the Bering Ma, being the Yarra River. And as I am speaking for my Kulin, I have to also, if you are any out there, say thank you to my Kulin brothers and sisters for allowing me this opportunity as well, and to my Kulin friends who have come to hear our talks today. Thank you. Sorry about that, I thought I did say Rufa, but never mind. <laughs> um, the topic is, of course, continues to be topical. Aboriginal people for the last couple of hundred years have uh, argued the same basic things about acknowledgement of sovereignty, and central to that is about issues to do with land. I'm not going to say very much, I'm just here to introduce speakers and then to uh, manage, I suppose, the discussion such as it needs to be managed, if it needs to be managed. Um, each speaker's got 12 minutes, and I'll be sitting in front of them making rude gestures so that you prefer can get home, if they go longer than that. And if you have questions, could you please rehearse them um, a little bit so that they're short and sharp so that we can get questions done quickly, and there'll be two roving mics uh, going through the audience as well. Uh, and address the question preferably to a particular speaker, but to the panel generally, if you like. Okay, the first um, speaker is Adam McLean. You've got uh, um, the bios on your seats, so I won't uh, spend time telling you who he is and what he does. You've got that in front of you. Adam, can... all yours. Thanks very much. I'm the, of the panel, I suppose, the token white person that uh, is going to give you an outline of where we're at as far as uh, native title is con concerned from a legal perspective, and I'm sure the other speakers will, will fill in the gaps that I miss. It's, uh, it's a bit of a daunting task. It's sort of, as Gary pointed out, over 200 years and 12 minutes, so um, I'm going to go as hard as I can to get through it all. What I didn't want it to be was a sort of a 101 native title and land rights, but uh, I will talk about some of the elements that uh, have got us to where we are today. 
I've also got a sheet that sh should be on your sheets, which is a, a, a little timeline of, of native title and land rights, some of the um, sort of key key decisions, key bit parts of legislation, bits of legislation that have come out, and that'll give you a, a bit of a, an outline as well. Look, just to highlight some of the aspects of, uh, from, that, from that timeline sheet, um, at 1788, of course, we had the, uh, the British claiming sovereignty, and it wasn't, and, and part of that 60s land rights, when did we want it, we want it now, was, came out of that was the first Aboriginal Land Rights Act in the Northern Territory. Now, that act has produced um, significant benefits to the Aboriginal community, and, and you'll see there that almost half of the Northern Territory is now in uh, uh, the hands of the Aboriginal land councils up there, and 80 percent 87% of the coastline has also been transferred. So that significant um, wins of, uh, from our point of view have, been, have happened in the Northern Territory. But it was a significant time later when we got the Aboriginal Land Rights Act in New South Wales. And I'm speaking from a New South Wales perspective. I spent most of my time, although I'm from Victoria, I spent most of my time in New South Wales doing native title and land rights work. Significant from the uh, New South Wales Land Rights Act is the is the proportion of land that's gone over to the Aboriginal Land Council system, and you'll see there it's, a, it's a roughly about 1%. And I'm sure that when the, uh, when the uh, drafters of that legislation and the, and the arguments about introducing that legislation were, were, were coming about, it wasn't envisaged that that much land would actually go across. It's, uh, you'll see down there at the bottom of that second section is that it's in the order of nearly $3 billion worth of land and uh, other assets of now in the hands of the Aboriginal Land Council system in New South Wales. So, I mean, again, it's significant. The other states haven't got, other states and territories haven't got anything like that as far as the system, including Victoria. And that's, I suppose, what uh, we need to start putting some energy and some thought towards. Um, of course, we had the Mabo decision in 1992, which led to the Native Title Act. And then after the Native Title Act, we were all working away lodging claims and we had significant impediments to getting agreements and getting our claims uh, to reach fruition. Um, and then we had the WIC decision, which uh, related to partial leases, of course, and uh, then we had the amendments to the Native Title Act. The amendments to the Native Title Act, the WIC amendments and the 10-point plan and all that uh, argument that happened then, a lot of it was about agreement making, native title processes and how do we get agreements. And I suppose we're standing here today um, asking ourselves why haven't we had the wholesale uh, agreements that uh, we thought we were going to have when, the, um, when we had the Native Title Act and the amendments to the Native Title Act. And it's sort of, uh, it's become topical now with Jenny Macklin, uh, Indigenous Affairs, Federal Indigenous Affairs Minister, um, talking about the wholesale uh, amendments to the Native Title Act. And uh, it's my, my view that, look, amendments, the Native Title Act might need some amendments, but it's the, uh, the agreement processes are there. The parties aren't reaching agreement. Um, you can change the act as much as you like. The fact is we've got parties out there that should be reaching agreement and are not reaching agreement. Um, now, it's not all doom and gloom, and as I've got a, I've got a, a little bit of a PowerPoint which I'll, which I'll rush through, but uh, it's something I've been working on for 14 years, or over 14 years, was a native title claim up in Byron Bay. And I chose this one. I've worked on a number of claims just because it's nice and sunny and hot up there. <laughs> and I thought I had some nice pictures. Uh, Warren's also worked with me in New South Wales on, on this claim. But uh, here's an agreement. And I'll just go through some of the salient points of an agreement process. And then the question will be, why, why isn't that agree these sorts of agreements happening all across Australia? Um, so it's an Indigenous land use agreement. And it's significant in that it acknowledged the, uh, the traditional owners, the Iraqal people as the custodians up there. And it also, the agreement provided for transfers of significant areas of freehold land for cultural centres, for housing. Uh, there's a caravan park, one of the uh, great caravan parks in Australia has been transferred over in freehold to the Aboriginal community to, find a, to provide an economic basis for, their, for that community. So there's significant uh, wins in that respect as far as an agreement process. And there's also a creation of a brand new national park, the Iraqal National Park, um, out of that process. And there it is, basically, uh, the water is a marine park, and that's all part of the process. And every bit of land you can see that's not built on there is, um, is part of the national park. The, obviously, the, one of the key elements of this uh, national park is the creation of traineeships and jobs. And uh, 
this is only part of the group that, are, that have uh, provided, the, got the jobs and the rest of it from that process. Right, and they're doing all sorts of good things up there from, you know, rangers. Uh, Norm Graham was actually from Victoria. Uh, uh, did his training in Victoria, but he's back up there now. And, uh, you know, there's field officers. They, um, there's all sorts of training, training going on and creating a real uh, sort of base for the, uh, for the community up there. Uh, as I said, it was a marine parks and Julian Rocks is significant land up there, a significant uh, site up there is uh, within the marine park. They created their own depot, they built their own structures. Uh, this is all on the uh, land, part of the marine park training. They'll get um, dive training. We've got commercial dive operators up there, all are indigenous. Um, they, they do all the servicing of all the uh, marine, you know, what do they call them? Anchors. <laughs> um, look after the grain of sharks up there around, uh, around Julian Rocks. They deal with marine mammal strandings. They've got the first indigenous whale rescue team. I'm told it's the only indigenous whale rescue team in the world. And they run around in uh, boats, uh, you know, taking lines and things that are caught up on, on whales and, uh, and disentangling them. Uh, the elders, we have a whole lot of celebrations. The elders are all on the board of management, so it's a, it's a whole community working together. Um, this is just some of the people working in this brand new national park. None of these people had jobs in this area before. This was all just vacant crown land, so they've created a significant national park, and there's some of the community, both black and white, which are working together, board members, staff, etc. So it's, it's not a bad little agreement. They won a uh, United Nations award uh, over in South Africa. They've uh, received the Pack, International Packards Award from the ICUN. And so there's a significant agreement, what uh, my point is, um, of colour, apart from a few nice pictures. So there's an agreement process. It happens, it can happen. Why isn't it happening? Why haven't we got these sort of wholesale agreements of dealing with this issue and other issues across New South Wales and uh, the rest of the country? Well, oh, how are we going on time? All right, so why haven't we got the, uh, the agreements? Well. One thing I learned from doing native title agreements, for a start, that took 15 years, that agreement, and, uh, which is a ridiculous amount of time. The other thing is that I learned from doing agreements that native title agreements are essentially 10% law and about 90% politics. And they shouldn't be that, but uh, that's the way that this, this system seems to, seems to have worked. And uh, I don't know if Warren would agree with that, but we put a lot of effort in politically to get these agreements rather than in doing uh, legal uh, agreements. So why an agreement's being reached? Well, a number of reasons, and you'll see the articles from Jenny Macklin in the paper. Part of the, the argument as to why agreements aren't being reached is that there's an internal Indigenous conflict within the native title groups, and that's true. Uh, most of the uh, agreements that I've been dealing with have some element of conflict within the Indigenous groups, but that shouldn't be seen as a, a, as a um, reason for not reaching agreements. And it uh, is often used by state governments, mining companies, and uh, other groups to say, look, we won't enter into agreements if there's a, you know, a level of internal dispute. Well, that's just a fact of life, and I don't think that should be used as a reason for not entering into agreements. There should be processes um, in order to work through these, these uh, internal disputes, but it shouldn't be used as an excuse as to why agreements aren't going forward. The other thing is that states, in my experiences in New South Wales, really want to get too heavily involved in the uh, internal Aboriginal uh, uh, elements that are necessary for native title claim. So as part of my sheet there, you'll see that native title, uh, there's no great uh, uh, magic in this, that uh, native title, you need to have descent, you need to have connection, and that connection has to be continuous connection. We've heard about all that. The third element is that the native title has not been extinguished. So it's, it's, it's relatively simple, and it's been overcomplicated, I think, in a in the media and other forums. But in New South Wales, what we've had is the state government really spending too much time dealing with the internal uh, um, material, if you like, that goes towards making the native title claim. And so we haven't been able to get agreements based on that process. Well, what are the solutions? There's some of the problems. What are the solutions? Uh, my view is that, and I've been pushing it for a number of years, is that it's up to the states and the federal government that they should promote this agreement-making process, not through just amending the Act, although the Act would be nice to have some amendments, but that's not the key to it. The key to it, I believe, is to have supported an agreement-making process through a framework agreement. So the states should 
follow the uh, framework agreement process, you'll hear this being talked about now and, and it's, it's sort of gaining momentum, is that certain levels of material by the native title group should be able to be put forward and then the states will say, well, there, here are the benefits that we will engage in an agreement process if you tick these sort of boxes. There should be a simple agreement making process which allows the groups to make that tick and say, yes, we're going to go down that road or we're not going to go down that road. We shouldn't have the situation where we've got the Byron Bay Agreement, uh, which has got all these great benefits and everyone's hailing it as a great agreement, it shouldn't have taken 15 years and um, it should have been able to be just, uh, that sort of agreement should just be able to be sort of ticked off the boxes and people should be able to start that process. Look, I'm getting the wind up now, so I'll finish it there, but that's a, a basic outline of uh, the native title and land rights regimes and some of the agreement making processes. Thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that, Adam. It is interesting, the business about internal disagreement stopping processes. I just thought that we have a car race down here in Melbourne, down on Albert Park Lake, where there was a great deal of disagreement, but it happened anyway. Um, and it's still happening, and it still costs the government or us taxpayers money, so that's an interesting furphy. <laughs> uh, our next guest is Warren Mundine. Warren, the stage is yours. Yeah, yeah thanks, for, thanks for having us, thanks for the introduction. Um, I'll just do a couple of things first. One is, of course, I'll do the acknowledgement of country. I do acknowledge the uh, traditional owners of the land who's, uh, who we're meeting on tonight and having to, uh, tonight's discussion, and I pay my respects to them, to their, their elders and past, present and future. And I thank you for the welcome. Thank you very much for that. Um, the other thing, too, I must have given an apology in regard to... Um, to uh, anyone who thought they were going to see Anthony Mundine here tonight. No, I'm Warren. I can understand the confusion because we have very similar athletic physical physiques. And uh, he, he's not, he, he used to not be the only ones who are confused. He actually told me the other day that he's at Melbourne El Airport after his fight here in Melbourne last week and he was mobbed by a group of women screaming, Warren, give us your autograph. So <laughs> it's good. Now, what I'd like to do is start off. Uh, I was actually asked to come along tonight and because of the, the background I have been the former National President of ALP and also a number of other areas uh, and I have a, a wide range of commentary on Indigenous affairs and policy and, and politics within Australia and about the drive forward, uh, how we should do things to drive forward. And, and of course with Adam I, I've worked, uh, uh, I, I, th I think the word work is used usually here, uh, Adam did a lot of the work uh, on the Byron Bay um, uh, project and it was a very successful project that had a great outcome and, and just on that uh, who would have ever thought that a native a, a, an indigenous dive team the only indigenous and the only indigenous dive team the only dive uh, professional dive team that's working uh, up and down the coast of New South Wales rescuing whales and, and 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 doing a whole heap of other stuff come out of a native title claim and so it says that we've got to do a lot of in, uh, interesting imagination and bending of governments to drive forward in this area. I sort of g g given card blanche tonight to talk about a number of things. One of the things which uh, brings up uh, to me is the economic importance of uh, native title and, uh, and, and land rights. And I don't think people should underestimate that. Uh, Jenny Macklin, the Minister for Indigenous Affairs and, and Housing and a million other things, uh, made it in her speech last week in the Mabo uh, speech saying that, that native title was critical, and this is the word she used, was critical to economic development and sustainability of Aboriginal communities and Aboriginal people. And I'll give you a few statistics and, and talk about a few things that really re enforce that. The most important ones, of course, when you look at it, is I was at the Mineral Council of Australia's annual conference last week, so all the major mining companies in Australia and overseas, as well as major investors like the Chinese, the Koreans and so on, were in Australia at that conference. And they were talking about what is the major economic driver of the Australian economy. And when you have a look at that, the major driver is the resources industry. If it wasn't for the resources industry, 
you know, don't underestimate it, we'd be in recession and we'd have a, a lot of problems in Australia. It is driving us forward and the biggest driver of that are the Chinese and of course the, the Koreans, the Japanese, the Indians and so on. So that North, the Southeast Asia, that North Asian region is driving it forward. When you look at that, the figures they gave us last week was that 60%, 60 percent, 60 percent of that is on Aboriginal land. That is on Aboriginal owned land under its various title, whether it be native title, whether it be uh, uh, through the Land Rights Acts, or whether it be through some other state regime that that land was handed over to Aboriginal people. So 60 percent of the economic drivers of Australia is on our land. And you look at that in the context that probably another 20, 30 per cent of that would be also on other land that Aboriginal people have an interest in, in various levels uh, through the Native Title Act, the Federal Native Title Act. So you're looking at um, you know, 80 to 90 per cent of the economic driver of Australia, uh, Aboriginal people have a major input into and it's on their land. So you've got to say, okay, and yet when you look at these communities, you look at the poverty of these communities, and you look at the wealth of Australia, and you look at what is driving that 10, well, it's 8 to 11 per cent of the Chinese economy forward, and you look at those other economies, you've got to start raising questions, okay, so what, what is it, the final outcome for Aboriginal people in this area? What Native Title has done, and I, don't, and I don't think people should underestimate this. What Native Title has done is put us, Indigenous people, a seat at the table. It's given us a seat at the table to, to work or negotiate with m large mining companies. The next agenda, which we, if you, some people would have seen my article in the, uh, the Age last week, is how Indigenous people now, with, through the native title process, now engage on the international stage, looking at using uh, our, that 60% resources and then the other 20 to 30% resources uh, on the international stage at an economic level, so that we actually do start getting those economic outcomes that benefit all of our communities. And this is where the next round of debate is about. How do we ensure that all this wealth, all these billions of dollars, and it is billions of dollars, even in, in New South Wales, which doesn't have uh, the, the mining activities that are happening in Western Australia, you're looking at $9 billion, $10 billion, $8 billion mines that have been opening up in the last 12 months. You're probably looking at another 35 mines. In Western Australia, you start looking at the Kimberleys, where you've got $45 billion worth of gas, petroleum and that, looking at that area, you're looking at the Pilbara and the Iron Ore area where you're looking at you know, projects from about $25 billion up to $45 billion. They're just figures that just blow my mind. So how do we ensure that those, those, that, that income, that, first of all, how do we ensure that there's proper negotiations, that Aboriginal people have uh, a proper seat at that negotiation table and have proper input, and then second of all, through the agreement process, any benefits that come out of that process, how do we ensure that one is the protection of our culture and the protection of our cultural heritage, as well as ensure that any economic benefits that come out of it, that we do receive, that, that receive those funds and we're able to then drive our communities forward. And these are, these are some of the things that, we, that we've got to have this discussion about. So the next round of talks that we want to do is actually go to any economic forum that's in the Southeast Asian and North Asian area. We should have, as Indigenous people, a seat at that table. You just work the maths out. $45 billion worth of gas exploration off the coast of um, Kimberleys. It's a, Kimberleys is, a, uh, is it ha, it's a, on Aboriginal land. 60% of $45 billion. Where are we at that stage at that table? So this is what we need to do about getting native title to play that critical role and have that critical outcome to get our communities out of poverty, get us into the wider economic area of Australia, but also the world stage. We do do that in a human rights area, but now we need to do that on an economic area. Well, some of the issues of our community is quite blatant to us is that it's poverty. We are living in po abject poverty. And the results 
of that poverty is all the things that you see in the in the Sacred Children's Report, so what you see in the Gordon Report, the Bonnie Robinson Report, and numerous other reports that talk about uh, the dysfunctionality and other problems, the education levels, the health levels, the substance abuse, and etc. That are, that is plaguing our communities, and cutting. You know, we've got a 17 years life expectancy difference between us and the rest of Australia's community. I was actually working it out that the average age of uh, you know 55 years for an Aboriginal man. So I haven't got much more time on this earth. I want to drive forward and make sure that we that we do have these outcomes. Now, so that's on our side. That's one thing for our side. But the other side is there's talk about uh, amending the, the NAVE Title Act. Now, of course, I'm not a supporter of the 10 year, the 10 point plan that came out in 19, 1997, 98 period. But at the same time, I think governments need to be a bit more imaginative and be a bit more fair dinkum about what they're doing. Uh, Adam alluded to that and actually said it in, in his talk. Uh, that governments, state governments, especially state and territory governments, need to get fair dinkum. You know, if we're having negotiations of 15 years, 10 years, one of the, one of the things I saw uh, was up in the mid-north coast of New South Wales. Uh, we sat down with the, with the elders, the, the aunties and uncles who were the original claimants for that area. There were six of them who were the applicants. There's only two of them still alive. The rest, because of the dragging out of this process over a six, 10, 12 year process, they're all dying before they actually see the end. Byron Bay is a good example. Um, we, we had the death of elders in that process as well. I just find it amazing that we go into the negotiations from day one and they're arguing this case about credible evidence and so on. And at the end of the day, what we say, put on the table on day one, we actually agree to at the end of the day. So we had 15 years, we have 10 years, 12 years of negotiations, people dying and they have an agreement at the end of the day that we agreed to on day one. I think state governments and charity governments need to be held accountable for that and I think it's about time the federal government... I thought you were being rude to me there, but, uh, but anyway, <laughs> it's two minutes. And as, um, uh, it's about time that the federal government, because it's their act, it's their negotiated outcome, start sitting down and through the COAG process, start making state and territory governments, you know, fair income, and saying, OK, you're talking about a, a negotiated outcome. Well, let's talk about a negotiated outcome. And that means we sit down and we, and we at least at least half, we, we should be able to, to half or probably quarter the time period for these negotiations to happen. And, the, and, and it has to have real economic outcomes from Aboriginal people. People talk about jobs in the mining industry and jobs in other areas. To me, they're things that are going to happen anyway. They should be happening anyway. They should be recruiting locally and getting Aboriginal people skilled up and job ready to take those jobs. To me, that's a bit outside the native title process. Because whether there's native title there or not, they were going to do that. What we should be doing is saying, OK, what is our percentage? What is our royalty? And how do we ensure that it is properly uh, spread through the Aboriginal community to get the economic outcomes that we need to, to improve our communities and drag them out of poverty? I just wanted to plant that seed in your head. And I want us to, and I want to have a good uh, question and answer session. Thank you very much. Thanks, Warren. I think the connection between the billions of dollars being taken out of the land and the fact that the people living on the land are living in poverty is really well made. And that's hopefully some questions going to come about that. The other thing I meant to say and didn't was that this is being filmed tonight um, and it's going to be used perhaps in documentaries or some TV shows or whatever it's going to be used for. So I guess if you don't want to be filmed, you'll have to hide behind a seat or something. Third speaker, Gary Murray. The floor's yours, mate. Um, I'm Gary Murray and um, they told me I've got to do 220 years in 12 minutes and um, 16 years of um, Mabo with the Native Title Act in about the same time so it's going to be interesting so I thought I'll just concur with the previous two speakers and um, show you some holiday snaps. 
That might be a way to go. Um, you got it? All right. Slide show there. Yeah, up top there. Uh, deduct this from my 12 minutes, please. Uh, <laughs> there's a technical problem. Can't work out a laptop. <laughs> right, oh, um, yeah, well, I've, I've answered the question. Um, we want land rights, of course we do. Um, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. It's as simple as that. Like, this is no uh, complex issue. Um, and I take um, Warren's point about um, native title is critical, but I think it might be critically ill in this state. I've got real problems with it, and um, as we go along, um, how do I move this thing along? Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, I'd better acknowledge the uh, Wurundjeri people uh, on whose country we um, stand, and um, I also acknowledge their esteemed ancestors and all the descendant family groups who come from those ancestors. And um, that's the crucial thing about native title or land rights or whatever. It's where you come from. And um, I come from these two of my ancestors, uh, late pastor Sir Doug Nichols and Lady Gladys Nichols on the right, and Pastor Doug Nichols' grandfather, Walt Benoom and John Jackie Logan. John Jackie Logan was his white name, of course, but he was around between 1840 to 1911. And obviously, um, Pastor and Lady Nichols were around between 1906 and 1981 in Nan's case, and in Grandfather's case, 1988. We did a statue up there to commemorate who they are and where they're connected to. Um, you know, one of the problems we have with native title is who the hell are we, you know? Um, we get asked this question all the time. Now, if I roll my family tree out, I think I've only done about a third of it, and um, back in 99 I did it, I think I, it'll go 12 metres that way. So what more do I have to do to prove to the state or to other people about who I am? And um, a lot of people can do that, it's not just me. My father, of course, um, I take the line that I have an Aboriginal father and an Aboriginal mother and I am multi-clan, ambilineal, the anthropological terms where um, I claim country through both sides. A lot of people have problems with that, but I don't. Um, it's something that's come out of a lot of the evidence that we've uh, given to people in the native title process and um, we've got no problems about running it. So we exert our rights between Wodonga right down to Swan Hill, down to Bendigo, across to Horsham across seven groups. And we've been doing that for a long time. In my own circumstances, I've been involved in native title stuff for 12 years. And that's why I say it's critical. 12 years is a long time to work towards getting some sort of resolution of those claims. Uh, where we are, we've got a claim across Wamba Wadi Barap, we've got a claim across Jar Jar Rung, we've got another one against Japagok and we're involved in the Wajabolic one, and we're doing a couple of other ones up in the northeast. So uh, we're out there having a crack at it. But I'm starting to wonder, uh, what are we doing there? Why are we putting on the table for governments to negotiate with us rights that come back from 3,000 generations ago for us to trade now and to exclude the next 3,000 generations and thereafter? I will have no truck with extinguishment if we can negotiate that. These are some of the issues we face. Now, it's a bit like if you inherit a house and then someone comes along and says, well, um, I don't know about whether you own that house, let's talk about it, let's prove your connection, and then you do a deal and the deal's not worth the price of the house. Put it in simple terms, but that's basically what they're asking us to do. Native title has been around for generations, 3,000 generations. Why are we trading it now? And why are state governments asking us to extinguish that? And I think they're points that we've got to put down as a black mark against this native title process. Not to say that some good things are not coming out of it. I think maybe I'm living in the wrong state, given what's going on in Byron Bay and elsewhere around the place. Um, I, I should think about relocating. In Victoria, 38 nations owned, managed, controlled all the resources and natural resource management stuff and cultural heritage. 27 million acres across the state, 38. 14 of those groups are now gone. 
off this planet forever. No one's put a claim in, in, in across those groups. The genocide's complete. So when someone says to me there's no genocide in Australia, I say, rubbish. Look at that map and tell me where some of these groups are. Where are the descendants? And they're not there. We know that. Um, we obviously got, once we got removed from our 27 million acres, we got put on missions. 250,000 acres of missions, 38 of them. And then we got shifted off that. So now we're down to about 30,000 acres across this state. So from 27 million acres, we've gone down to 30,000. That is not an economic base. It is not an economic base. It is not a cultural base. It is it's not a dot on the map of Victoria. We also have um, all these organisations, obviously the cultural scene and the social structures have all changed, the traditions and the customs have changed, but we're still here. We're still here. The groups are still here, the ones that are still active, the genocide hasn't been complete on. And we want justice. We want land justice. You know, we're tired of this native title bullshit. Governments can make agreements. They do it all the time. They can convert crown land to freehold land all the time. They do it for white fellows. They do it for corporations. They do it for some poor fella who needs access to his property so he wants to turn a bit of crown reserve land into freehold. So he pays the government money. Government comes to us and says, look, can we do a deal here? And we do a deal. So obviously they do it. Our population today in Victoria, and I'm focusing on Victoria, of course. I don't live in Byron Bay. The country has got 15,000 odd people living out there, and it's, in Melbourne it's about 14,000. So we know that they're spread between about 11 traditional owner groups across this state. If we're going to talk about economic modelling and economic development, you've got to start putting the data together. You've got to start relating the poverty and why a kid, a 14-year-old girl, hangs herself in a cupboard in Robinvale because she's depressed. And it goes on and on. We can quote lots of cases like that in terms of the death arrangements that happen here in Victoria. You've got to relate that poverty to where we're going with this land rights stuff if we're going to go there. Native title hasn't solved too many issues here in Victoria. We've also got to think about what's our relationship to those non-traditional owners that have come here, that have been dispersed from Queensland and Northern Territory and that. So we need to really start working out where we sit with those non-traditional owners as Victorians, Victorian traditional owners. And that's a really important issue. I had to raise that issue because it's cropped up in the context of some government departments saying, well, we don't support traditional owners because, you know, we support all the Aboriginal people in Victoria. But I think you've got to start with traditional owners first. And then we start dealing with the relationships with every, everybody else, including the Torres Strait Islanders. Something like 500 to 3,000 Torres Strait Islanders live in Victoria. What's their relationship as traditional owners to Torres Strait Islanders and other island people as well? Um, you know, traditional owner groups aren't resourced to deal with the bloody environment that we've got out there, and particularly the legislative one. This is just a snapshot of what we have to deal with. The Commonwealth legislation, obviously the Native Title Act, Heritage Act. We've also got our own Aboriginal Heritage Act now, which has just been enacted in the last year or two, which has created some very special issues out there. We've also got the Heritage Council that has been hand-picked by the state. And I reckon this hand-picking thing, I don't know about that. You know, what happened to democracy? Whatever happened to the, the rights of people to elect their representatives who speak on their behalf? It's gone missing in Victoria. The Heritage Council, the Victorian Aboriginal Heritage Council, is an unrepresentative swill that makes the wrong decisions for Aboriginal people in this state. The Premier's advisory committee is not much better. Extracts from the old ATSIC. The Aboriginal Housing Board's even going that way. We've got Native Title Service Victoria reappointing themselves as board members last year. Now, it seems to me there is a bad political movement out there where government's exploiting 
Jackies, Uncle Toms, people who don't represent traditional owners, I'm going to say it. It's time it was said, if this what traditional owners want, is this what all Aboriginal people want in Victoria and elsewhere? We saw the absolute farce of the National Indigenous Council. The Victorian rep was that guy that played footy. He should have stuck to playing footy. We never seen him down here. And he was our rep. This is sort of the political environment we operate in. I won't talk about that one. Um, so what's the score? My son plays footy for Essendon. I've got two minutes. Um, I say this. For $100 million in this state, we've come to three agreements worth about $7.4 million. That is poor economic outcomes. That is poor economic modelling. We've got to change that. I won't talk about that. Um, yes, Rob Hulls, he's a good fella. He's Attorney General, Minister for Justice and the Deputy Premier. Um, he's, he, you know, he wants to see some agreements going. So why can't we get them going? Why do the bureaucrats keep throwing up obstacles for us to jump so that we can't simply sit down with somebody and do an agreement? Why do we have to wait 12 years? Three agreements in this state, 12 years it's taken. We've got another 20 out there to do. So that means the last one might get done 100 years from now, maybe. I really think we've got to get back to basics. I really think we've got to start talking about people's rights and we've got to start negotiating good outcomes. And I don't think we're doing that at the moment. I think our leadership is mediocre in this state. It is mediocre and, the re and that reason is, is obvious because we're not getting the outcomes. We need, from a traditional owner's perspective, we need a state body that's going to show strong leadership, similar to what, not, not as the same, but the Northern Land Council's pretty strong, the New South Wales Land Council's pretty strong, um, Tasmanian Land Council's pretty strong, but we need a body that needs to be funded to get out and do the sort of things that Warren's talked about, and Adam, that's not happening. We're too focused on native title. It's time it got removed from the agenda. My advice is, don't do a native title claim. Things are changing out there. Do an agreement and go for it. The ILC, I, I've got to do some time on these fellas. That's their record up there. 216 properties, 6 million hectares across Australia. Victoria's on the bottom, 4,900 hectares. The rest of the place is speak for themselves. Western Australia, two million. Queensland, one million, etc., etc. There might be a good reason for that, but given that the ILC was set up for the most dispossessed, I don't accept it. And you shouldn't either, because they have a $1.6 billion investment fund. They should be acquiring a lot more land en masse here in Victoria for the dispossessed, to give us that economic development base that Warren talks about. I won't talk about that. We had a man, an ILC board member on the, on the Victoria, the national board. We haven't got one. We used to have one, but that's gone. We demand equity in their dealings and we demand that the state and the ILC think, get together and develop some funding arrangement so we can start buying land back. Well, we have to. We want agreements, of course we want agreements, and um, obviously I'm going to speed right through this. <laughs> we also need to get into really big economic development strategies. This is a, a, a Kanita is a Indian reservation model that I went and visited in 1987. Big reservation, of course, one million acres, but it's an arrowhead type shaped building. Where's ours? Where's our cultural facility, multi-purpose, two towers, 40 storeys high, building in the CBD that's linked back to those traditional owners? Where is the showcasing of our cultural heritage in this state? Down the back alleys, in the southern part of the CBD, out of sight, out of mind. That's the Heritage Trust, where it is at the moment. It needs to expand. We need to expand this concept. It's going to create jobs and training. That's what it'll do. So we've got to get right into that stuff. And why shouldn't this be part of a major economic strategy right around Australia? Every capital city should have one. Sydney's talking about it, and the city of Melbourne's talking about it. We're just trying to push it along a little bit. Um, to fund this stuff. Of course we need land rights legislation, I'm going to wind it up, uh, but we also need some sort of Victorian Indigenous Futures Investment Fund, maybe. But really it's reparation, ongoing compensation for the loss of our lands and the loss of our languages and all the stuff that's happened to us. 
Maybe that's what we've got to start talking about. Maybe that softens a blow about reparation and compensation, because maybe land rights is too big a word that people, they just cannot digest that particular thing. Um, so I think we've got to start talking that up too. We need that fund that will allow us to get land back and to develop that land. Victoria has the worst record of any state in Australia, we all know that. Ditto the Indigenous Land Corporation, and we need to change all that. So I'm not going to dwell on this too much more, but simply say that um, we're into agreements. We don't need the Native Title Act. We don't need a Cultural Area Act that uh, commits genocide on our people, like the state one does at the moment. And we need to get good, strong leadership up there that's going to have a go. Get back out in the streets. Do the big reconciliation marches again. And you guys can help with that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Gary, as always. <laughs> no, I think uh, what you say is really valid, and I think that it is up to us to start supporting some of that and supporting uh, Aboriginal people in Victoria, starting with traditional owners, to get some of the stuff moving. Aretha? Please. Clements, Yama Cray Briggs. Nga dano nga tana juk, toma tamanga, nyuwanda na, toma beang, banjolong, balianong, beameong, bea nyuwanda nda ya emalang. Ya nuran, woiwarong, bunwarong, wamba wamba, jaja warong, tan warong, wado warong, kundi jamara, kanai. Lechi Lechi, Kurnai, Mari Mari, Tari Dari, Yakuri and Bena Victorian. Papa the Banarak, Nadan or Loch Patch Narak. Yori Yori Ok, Kanangor, Nah Loch Patch Nuranak. Nini Yaro will Yori or Lochpa, Yawana Malam, Nuandanak, Nangade, Nuandan Yen Bena, darling Victorian. They went got the Ganaya Kapna, they went Dungalanja, Lodgepa, Naiwaya, Warawa College in. Student Ya Lodge Pampanga, Yori or a Lodge Patch, Kutapka, Naruk, Yanga, Nan, Gulan, Kutapka, Bayerapan, Birayan, Damnam. They went Lodge by a Dungaja, Merit, and New and Danian Bena. They Nini got the Ganajiania, Towara, New and Dan Victoria in Yen Bena, Kutapka. Ya dan o tam nan daling narok, loj pach narok, kanangor, nyuan dan yakaramja, papara, papara narak, yen bena narak. If you're Australian, you should understand what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm basically going to call on your personal experiences, your IQ and your common sense as I deliver my message here today, which is, of course, targeted at our language of Victoria. I'll give you a very quick translation of what I said. Uh, my name's Aretha Briggs. My homeland is of the Yori Yora, of the Yori Yora and of the Woiwurrung. My country on Yori Yora country is Yalapna, along the Murray River, and my country on Woiwurrung country is Wurundjeri Balak, which is on the Yarra River up around Wonga Park area, just up past Warrandyte, and backs onto the Hillsville area. My grandparents, as I said earlier, are Selwyn and Geraldine Rose Briggs. My introduction to you also, as I give it, is a very traditional one. It is an introduction that my ancestors have used for thousands of years, which I'm hoping to revive. I'd love to give my love and respect to all my ancestors and invite them to join us today to make this a comforting and welcoming to all our family and friends of the Kulin Nation. It has been a long time that I've wanted to address my community in my own tongue, my grandmother's language. She was my teacher along with my, her daughter, Hillis Maris. Uh, 
I've just given you an example of Yorta Yorta being spoken on a fluent basis. I get my background with language. I was raised in northeast Arnhem Land. My mother is Margaret Wurrapunda, who married into the Yolngu people in northeast Arnhem Land, and I was adopted and taken in by uh, my grandmother, who was deceased, who I referred to as Mormor. She taught me a lot about what my grandmother from Victoria also taught me. They both actually shared the same totem, so I feel very privileged to have a, a modern day and a traditional outlook on my totem. Uh, over the years, I've watched confused children walk into my classroom, as I've also been a teacher at Warrawa College for over 21 years, and had the experience of witnessing students walk into my classroom, Aboriginal students that is, uh, with confusion and towards their identity. I've also witnessed the healing that comes from t learning their own language and from learning about sacred sites, whether it be Uluru and Alice Springs, or the Great Dividing Range in Victoria that reaches up to Queensland. A lot of the children came from right across Australia, but we all had one thing in common, and that is that we are the descendants of the sovereign owners of Australia, and we have a very strong responsibility to uphold their wishes and their concerns for, obviously, the future descendants and their future generations to come. Uh, the main issues that I'd like to raise today, my main points, from uh, working with language over 21 years of my life, my grandmother actually had me teaching at 14 years of age, so I've been teaching language for a while now. And I've noticed um, within my teaching that a lot of our people, not only Aboriginal people, but Australian people, are walking around very confused. Very confused about who they are as Australians or who we are, are as Aboriginal people. And it's got a lot to do with the false stories, the false histories that are being placed upon us and we need to hear the truths be told. The children need to have the truths, your children, our children. So I'm basically calling on all of my brothers and sisters here today, brothers and sisters under the same, living on the same mummy country, Australia, to raise the awareness that our people need our language which connects us to a land like a sick person needs medicine. Uh, our doctor is our land. Our doctor is our language. It gives us all the answers that we may have. Any questions that my children or my great-grandchildren may have, I hope to be able to answer them for them because I learnt it through my history of my people and what we've already been through. And it's not only in 250 years. Victoria is pr probably... It's been at the forefront with um, delivering and reviving Aboriginal language, with Warrawa College leading in the forefront. Unfortunately, we haven't had the support from federal and local governments in funding, which has really put us up back on the back foot. And I've got to say, I congratulate New South Wales on finally getting their language policy through, which has seen them move forward, the horses bolted when it comes to the language in New South Wales and how far they have come in uh, training their Victorian with their policy. They, they have been able to get the funding to train the Victorian Aboriginal language teachers uh, to have a formal response for local and federal governments in regards to rights of Australian Aboriginal people to decolonise their social status and revive and reclaim their own identity and language revive the language at a local level so that not only the Aboriginal people can learn their language, but all people within the community of the land that they may be living on can learn the language that belongs to the area that they live on eventually. Local language resources centres need to be developed within the, uh, the co Aboriginal communities. The language centres need to be developed within the country where the language is spoken. At present, we only have VACL, which I've got to say, is presently seen as a big brother uh, when it comes to the Aboriginal communities because we're not allowed to currently make decisions without VACL um, being, a big, being seen as the big brother who um, says yay or nay to what the community's actual needs may be. So we'd like to see the power go back to the communities rather than see everything under the one organisation. And that, as you can imagine, there's a bit of controversy 
within Aboriginal organisations, referring to what Gary mentioned earlier, we have sovereign owners who have a little bit of knowledge about their language and we've got people that come from other countries that are bringing their own identity to Victoria. So there's a bit of confusion again that's set, set down amongst our people. Uh, the last thing I'd like to probably mention is um, Aboriginal organisations. What are Aboriginal organisations doing to support the revival and reclamation of our language and culture? With all, with all what we've spoken about today with land rights, our people are dying, as we all know, at a very fast rate. Our young people are finding it harder and harder to adapt to situations of today. Our people are one of the most amazing people in the world. We, uh, in 250 years, we've learned how to speak English just as good as any English-speaking person. But I think now it's time for us to learn about ourselves and to share with you who you are as Australians in regards to this country. There's a lot that you are still to know about yourselves as Australians coming from this country, as there is just as much to learn about the Aboriginal people. And until our people have the right to express themselves in our language and until you have the right to know our sacred sites by their language names, whether it be Uluru, whether it be Birang Ma, these places are very sacred, not only to us, we'd like to think that they're sacred to anyone who walks on this land. Australia is a very sacred place, we consider it the Garden of Eden, and it is only last week I read in the Kuri, Kuri Mail that the Canadian Prime Minister is about to say sorry to a people who were colonised 500 years before us. So it is only from the work that has been done by our people that that's been able to come about. So I'd also like to say that you will help not only the Aboriginal people in calling on these issues to be raised, but you'll be helping the rest of the Indigenous people throughout the world and hopefully not only Indigenous but all human beings throughout the world and let's try and get it right for the future. Thank you.